This is the Horse Radio Network. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I am Coach Jen in sunny Ocala, Florida. And I'm Mary Kitzmiller from Kent, Texas, and you are listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for June 11th, episode 2454. Today's show is brought to you by Horseware. Good morning, Horse World. What is your favorite day of the week? never stop learning, you never stop understanding. It's more in depth than just riding a horse. Exciting, knowing that for the rest of my life I could work on this and, and I'll never stop learning. Welcome back. Second Thursday of every month, Mary Kipsmiller and I, Coach Jen, get together. And we geek out on all things horse and human training. Uh, what you been up to, girlfriend? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we're already into the next month. Um, <laughs> this has gone simultaneously slow and really fast at the same time. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah. May, been... May went by really fast because nothing happened. There's no, there are no uh, mile yeah. markers because nothing happened anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the murder hornets weren't as big a deal as I thought they were going to be. So that was just kind of a filler episode. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of May's thing. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, been pretty busy here. We've been filling orders in the online shop, making jewelry, all that fun stuff. And uh, picked up two new additions to the ranch this week. So that's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Behind the scenes, I'm, I'm going to call call mary out here a little bit dropped mary a reminder the other day don't forget your shows this week okay i'm at an auction we'll post later and then i go over to my facebook page and i start seeing really 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 adorable pictures of donkeys everywhere what kind of auction were you at so it was an adoption that we did have an auction format and uh i picked up two baby wild burrows from the BLM in Paul's Valley. Um, one of them uh, I'm going to be using to compete for what is known as a tip challenge. And this is kind of like a Mustang makeover. It's put on by Mustang Heritage Foundation. It's just another thing they're doing to try to help get these animals out of holding and into good homes. Uh, so it's an in-hand competition, and it's usually just uh, open to Mustangs. And I wasn't going to do it. I've got too many horses and too many things going on and, you know, wasn't really paying attention. And then the promoter of the show was like, oh, um, if you guys want to enter, um, you know, last minute, there are burrows to do it with. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to You're do in. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, I got the teeniest little donkeys in the whole world. They are so cute. We We must use those on the show notes picture for the day because yeah yeah go to the website horse radio network or horses in the morning.com for today's episode on june 11th 2020 and check out the super adorable pictures or even better you can like and follow mary kitzmiller on facebook and i'm sure there will be pictures of them regularly now is it better to, it's best to follow you on your training page what's your facebook page for your training so my Facebook page is Mary Kitts Miller Horsemanship. So if you enter that in the search bar, you should be able to find me. I'm also uh, on Instagram under the same name. Um, and, yeah, I've been posting a little bit more on Instagram lately. I'm kind of an old fogey and still trying to figure out how all these crazy Internet apps the kids are using uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, it's... Because they change, it's the nature of computer programs and apps to change with, um, they, it's that they like, they breed like rabbits. That's how often computer programs change. So the minute you've got it figured out, it's next week, it's, you know, you got to do it all over again. But yeah, check her out on well, Facebook. Well, now everyone's saying you got to do TikTok and, uh, 
it just frightens and confuses me. I'm too old. But that's apparently the next big thing, which to me it's just a rip off of Vine, which I love, where you do the little videos and super cute. So I guess I got to figure that one out now. Well, more power to you, girlfriend. More power to you. Well, coming up on today's show, as I alluded to earlier, we're going to chit chat about all things training. We've got a whole heap of really interesting questions to exercise our gray matter. And those questions come from the Horse Radio Network auditors. Who are they? They are a special gang of folks who love to listen to Horse Radio Network programming, and they become our auditors by uh, chucking in a couple of bucks every month via our Patreon account to help support Horse Radio Network, its functions, as well as its hosts. And by doing that, they get the privilege of being on the Horse Radio Network auditors Facebook page. And that is where we post things like, do you have a question for Mary? Or do you want to come on the air with Mary or various and sundry other things like that? So if you'd like to help support Horse Radio Network programming as well as have that option, you can just go to Horses in the Morning or HorseRadioNetwork.com and click on the Become an Auditor banner. It's usually on the right-hand side of the page. But if you're listening to this episode in June of 2023, it may have moved. So just look around the page. You'll find it. Now, today's training tip, we always start with Mary's training tip, which is always inspired by something in her life. And it says here in my notes that we're going to talk about helping your horse find a a center, find center. So A, what inspired it? And B, what the heck does that mean? I have no idea. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I don't think, I don't think this gets touched on enough in general horse training. I mean, we're always just like, well, how do I make my horse canter? Well, you kick here, pull here, and then he canters. And you know, it, we we kind of tend to gloss over how do we help them start from a good place mentally so that they can take in the information that we're trying to teach them. And I think this the idea for this uh, came from, uh, I believe it was in the auditor group. Someone was asking a question. I can't remember what the question was, but it made me think of this answer. Um And it's something that has really helped me with my horses over the last several years. And um, pretty much what it is, and it's a little abstract, there's no one way to get here. But when I first start working with a horse, especially like a wild mustang or these baby burros, um, an animal that is going to be, can be very flighty because they're wild and unhandled and they've never uh, been led before. Um, the first thing that I want to teach them before I really try to start touching them and getting halters on them and lunging them around and all of this stuff is to find a place where that horse knows everything is okay here. Everything is safe. I'm okay. I feel relief. I want to stay here. And if I'm ever confused or scared, this is where I will go. So it's kind of like a home base. If you ever don't know what to do, I want you to do this and everything will be okay. So usually that lesson for for my horses um, is teaching them how to face up, how to face me. Um, Because uh, this works for several reasons, but the main one is if a horse is looking at me, um, it's very hard for uh, him to pull that rope out of my hands and get away from me. So Um, if a horse is looking at me, but he's still trying to move his feet, but he's got his eye on me, I can keep control of him. If he turns around and is looking away from me and then runs forward, that rope is coming out of my hands. Uh, so, you know, it's a practical thing of, I want you to look at me. This is the first lesson we're going to work on is look at me, stay facing me, put your eyes on me. And I help the horse find that. So in the case of the Mustangs, Um, I help them find it by using a little pressure and energy until they give me focus, look at me, put your eyes on me. And as soon as they do that, I try to get, you know, really release pressure. I walk backwards. I give them distance. I give them space. And I let them sit there as long as they want. And it doesn't have to be a wild horse that you do this with. You can start this with any horse. Um, And... One of the programs I've been looking into lately that has really helped kind of confirm my own thoughts on the subject is, uh, I've mentioned it before, it's that 4BP um, uh, program. There's a gentleman in Australia who who promotes it, and 
Uh, but I've seen this kind of concept in a lot of horsemanship programs, a lot of natural horsemanship programs, uh, is getting that horse to face up. And that's number one. So I don't run them around the round pen first and then get them to face up. It's like, as soon as I walk into the pen, look at me. If you look at me, everything's going to be okay. And at first, when you teach something like this to the horse, especially a wild horse, they'll look at you just for the sake of, well, this is where you don't bother me so much, so I'm just going to keep my eyes on you. But the more you practice this and the more you reward and release the horse for going here, look at me, look at me, look at me, the more they will put themselves there um, when things are scary. So I've had it happen countless times. I'm leading my Mustangs around for the first time, and they're starting to learn how to give the pressure, and something happens. Maybe the garbage truck goes by and uh, is slamming the garbage cans around, and it really freaks that horse out. And instead of bolting and running, you know, pulling that rope out of my hand, they might jump and then look at me. And they're like, what do I do? And that's exactly what I want to happen. So a horse is a prey animal. We cannot train the prey animal out of them. We can't breed it out of them. Lord knows we've tried over thousands (laughs) of years. But there's always going to be that small part of them that says, run, run first, think later. Um, So... I can't. I, I would love to have my horse completely and utterly bomb-proof to where nothing ever bothers him ever. But I know that's not possible. Something is going to spook him. Something's going to cause him to scramble, move his feet, and something's going to make him think: run, run, get away. Think about it when you're a million miles, you know, from the danger. So what I can do instead is I can tell the horse, listen, I know you're going to be scared. You're not in trouble for being scared. It's just going to happen. And I know that you're going to want to move your feet. You're going to want to react. You're going to want to scream for help from your buddies. But here's what I want you to do. If you're scared and it's okay and you need to move your feet, that's okay too. But do it with your eyes on me because that that's going to help me keep a hold of you. So if, like, I'm in a busy parking lot at a horse show and someone else loses their horse and it's running all over the parking lot and people are screaming. Oh, I hate that. The loose yeah. horse and it comes screaming. Oh, yeah, it creates And everyone's chaos. running and yeah. throwing things because all of a sudden we forgot how to be horse trainers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want my horse, you know, to go, oh, my God, what is that? Oh, I should look at my person. And she's going to help me get through this. So this doesn't all this doesn't just apply to like the first lessons with a wild or unhalter broke horse. Um I can use this throughout my entire horse training program. Another exercise that's very similar is teaching them to lower their head. And teaching them to lower their head, one, it gives them a job to do, especially if maybe they're a little stressed out and they, they need something to occupy their mind. Say, hey, why don't you just lower your head? Um But it also creates, I don't know why, it's almost mystical, it creates this relaxation. Um, I can take a nervous horse and start gently having them lower their head, and they might throw their head back up, I'll lower it again, and we might play this yo-yo game of head up, head down, head up, head down, and then all of a sudden that horse will just go, lick, chew, lick, chew, lick, chew. And it's actually how I build my lay down, is off of just simply teaching them to lower their head. Um, And so if I'm, say waiting uh, in the at the end of my class at the horse show for them to call placings, and it's taking forever, and my horse is nervous because it's the first class of the day, um, I'll just say, hey, why don't you just lower your head and do that? Um, and it can automatically put my horse in the sense of, oh, okay, I have something to do. This makes me feel good. I've gotten a lot of reward and relief from this in the past. I'm happy here. And I actually learned this concept working with reining trainers. If you watch the high-level reiners, um, one of the first things you'll see in, in a pattern where the horse has to walk to the center and then start their pattern, whether it spins or lead departures or whatever, they walk to the center of the pen and that horse, they put their horse's head down. And um, one of my favorite analogies of all time, I heard from uh, a ranching guy who does cow horse and stuff, why he teaches his horse to lower their head from the saddle is it lets all the marbles roll back in their head. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it kind of does. <gasps> gives them a, gives them a chance to. Uh, we used, we used, I used to call that brain cell division back in the day. Yeah, get 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 the brain to work again. So, 
this, this is a, a question I always like to pose to myself and others. So we're trying to teach our horse to find center, to find the safe place. And we're going to give him the safe place task. In other words, for you, it's you look at me and we're good. When teaching that process, as a trainer, I've never taught that process before. Are there any red flags that might come up during the process that I'm doing it wrong and I'm about to cause a train wreck? I would say the thing you want to steer clear from is treating it as, uh, don't think of it as, I'm going to punish you if you don't do this. Um, I think sometimes we get too aggressive and we focus on what our horse is not doing right, what they're doing wrong, instead of, when can I let this horse know he's being good? Now, you can still get, you can still be very effective being aggressive and using more punishment, but... I don't think you will ever truly get to that horse's mind and get him to feel totally right by thinking too much in terms of punishment. And I see this. I love the round pin. I love round pin training. I start everything in the round pin, but I think it is far too abused. I think um, I see too many people go at it from, oh, you're not looking at me or you're not paying attention to me and following me around. Well, I'm going to chase you until you're so tired that you, you know, you have nothing else to do. Now, that's not to say that teaching your horse to go walk, trot, canter around the round pen and teaching him to move forward, that's not to say that it's bad. We need to teach him those skills too. But I, I see people do it too much. I, I've, I've heard people say, oh, my horse won't let me bridle him today, so I'm going to go run him in the round pen until he does. I'm like, no, <laughs> he's, he's not going to equate those two things together. All you're doing is wearing him out. Um and exhausting him, and yeah, he might be complicit once you know, he might be um, he might uh, be a good boy once you've tired the heck out of him. But tomorrow, when he's fresh, you're going to start all over again. So when you teach things like this, whether it's teaching your horse to lower his head, or teaching him to face you, or any of those behaviors where you just kind of want to, you know, teach him this is where I want you to be. If you are ever unsure, you need to do this behavior. Don't ever come at it where. If he doesn't do that, you're going to make him regret it. So you can use pressure, you can use energy, but use the mindset of when can I release, when can I reward, when I when can I let my horse know that he's doing good. And if you think about it from that standpoint, that horse will actively seek that position you put him in um, in the future because he knows, oh, this is where everything is okay and I want to be here more often. Yeah, I'm way, way back in the day when I used to work for PetSmart, I was the state line TAC manager. I'm going to date myself back when state line TAC was owned by PetSmart. One of the things, one of the little bits of knowledge that I gained from the dog trainer that worked at our store, a lovely lady, uh, best way to teach your dog to stop barking is to teach him to bark. In other words, yes. you're, you don't focus on teaching your horse to not do something. Teach your horse to do something that then can then translate into not doing something else. Like you're not teaching your horse to not put his head up. You're teaching to horse, your horse to put his head down. They're very different things, aren't they? Yes. Yes. And that is a whole other realm that makes my brain tie in little pretzel knots of, of <laughs> understanding animal behavior. Um, it's very easy, especially if you are having challenges with your horse, to think about all the things you don't want him to do. But you need to, in order to get him to not do those things, you need to think about the things, what do I want him to do instead? So if you come to me and are like, my horse, he won't stand still, and he's screaming at other horses, and I don't want him to do those things, say, okay, well, what can you tell your horse to do instead of those things you don't want him to do? So instead of thinking, I want him to stop running around and trying to pull the rope out of my hands, think, well, I would like him to stand quietly facing me with his head down. And if you give your horse, here's what you can do instead um, you'll be a lot more clear to them, and it really helps settle them um, mentally. The, the thing I like to think about, it's, it's an analogy I've used before, is um, 
if I'm not right in the if if I'm in a a really scary situation, let's say I'm in the top floor of a burning building, and I don't know how to get out, so I'm just running around, just panicking, freaking out. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid for my life, and all of a sudden. Um, a firefighter in full firefighter regalia and uniform comes crashing through a window with a hatchet in his hand, and he says, follow me. I know what to do. I'm going to go, oh, thank God, and I'm going to have the wherewithal to help get myself to safety. And a lot of problems we have with our horse are the same thing. It's not, oh, my horse is being naughty and he has attitude. It's He's scared, he's anxious, he he doesn't know what to do. He is looking for help. And if you don't provide him with an answer, here's what you can do to be safe and to feel okay, they're going to come up with their own answer. And that's where you get buddy sour, barn sour, pacing, screaming, rearing, spooking, bucking, bolting. It's all them just trying to save their lives. They don't know what to do. So if you come in and say, hey, I've got something for you, give them a simple job. I want you to keep your eyes on me. And maybe lower your head a little bit. And you might have to work on that over and over and over again. You just work on that simple task. Anytime their head shoots up and they scream for their buddy, say, hey, look at me again. Why don't you put your head down? And you might have to repeat this 3,000 times. But if you stay in there with that horse, eventually they'll go, okay, I can do this. Here's something I can focus on and I feel good for doing it. There we go. Our training tip for the month. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, hear a little message from our title sponsor today, Horseware. Horseware, I'm sure you are aware, makes all sorts of great horse clothing. But by the way, they also make people clothing. I'm just putting this out there. One of my favorite pair of riding tights is Horseware brand. So if you've never checked them out, you can go over to Horseware.com and do check those out. But uh, we're gonna hear from them. And while we're hearing from Horseware, why don't you pick out your first question to answer from our HRN auditors? Sounds great. Another long, tough fly season is right around the corner. And the only choice for this fly season are the Amigo range of fly sheets because they're built tough and feature the latest in design comfort, bug-busting technology, and sun-protecting fabrics. And the Amigo range has a fly sheet for every budget. From the Amigo Bug Buster Vamoose with no fly zone, to the Amigo Bug Rug Fly Sheet. Find Amigo Fly Sheets at your local or online retailer, or you can visit horseware.com. That's horseware, H-O-R-S-E-W-A-R-E.com. Makes me twitchy when I hear that insect music. (laughs) Yes. All right, who are we going to hear from first today? Okay, it's actually the first question on my list. Uh, it comes from Ursina Steadhalter, which is kind of a cool name. She was destined to have uh, horses. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, her question, I have a training question. Unstarted four-year-old, he's halter broke, good on the ground leading. I'd like to teach him to lunge. Normally, I longline horses, but I think this is step one. I don't have a round pen, just a 100 by 200 arena. What are your steps to teaching a horse to lunge? That's a terrific question. And even if I'm teaching my horse to lunge in a round pen, I'm still going to do it with the thought in mind that I will want to do this out in the open um, someday. So I need to give him all the buttons needed so that he doesn't drag me everywhere when there are no fences handy to help keep everything contained. Um, so this goes into another would be excellent training tip for a show is how to break a complex behaviors down into more simple steps. So when we think of lunging, we often think of, well, I want the horse to go around me in 47 circles and then maybe go the other way in 47 circles. Um, but if a horse has never lunged before, um, you know, he doesn't understand the concept of circles and um, it can be uh, pretty challenging to help him figure that out, how not to run in too close to you or to run off, kind of dragging you around or make the circles eggs. Um, and 
if your horse is running around and he's a little nervous and he's really uppity and going too fast and you want to stop him, well, do you have any buttons to get him to stop? What if you want him to change directions? How are you going to get him to change directions? What if he goes around you but those circles are so small and you're afraid that if he kicks out at a fly or just kicks out because he's having fun, you're, you might get your head kicked off. So you've got to teach him all these little buttons. Uh, to make that lunging process go smoothly. And in the process of teaching that, you're just gaining more precision with your foot control, which is going to help you under saddle. Finally, the reason you really want to think about all these things is um, some horses will, um, you can tire down pretty easy by lunging them around a few circles and they, they don't want to be as silly under saddle. But some horses, some breeds of horses, or depending on how fit your horse is, um, you can lunge them for a year and they're still going to no, be there's no effect. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, some of your horses like your Arabians and certain bloodlines of quarter horses, um, thoroughbreds, they, they're like, I could do this all day. I don't care. Um, and so it's not just about how sweaty can I get my horse before I ride, you know, and you don't want to waste your horse before you ride them. You don't want them so tired. They can't then do the ride. So by teaching them, you know, these little steps and how to have more precision and body control, you're going to get them using their mind. So with lunging, the first place where I want to start is actually what we talked about earlier is I want my horse to face me. I want him looking at me, paying attention, ready to listen to the next cue I'm going to give. Um, And I'd like him to be a certain distance away from me. Um, so that he's not tempted to kind of step on my toes and try to dig through my pockets for cookies. So being able to teach your horse to back out of your space when you want is a handy, um, is a handy thing to have. So you might start there just keeping your feet still and using your lead drip or lunge whip or whatever cue you want to teach your horse to back away, um, you know, several steps until he's kind of out of your space a little bit. So you might just spend your whole first day just teaching that. I want you to face me. I want you to back out of my space. So now what do you do? Um, If your horse is facing you and you say, you crack the whip and say, go forward. Well, he's probably not going to run smack into you, but he is probably going to run really close to you as he starts that circle. And again, if he's really fresh and he wants to kick out or there's a fly or he's distracted, if he runs in too close to you, you might be collateral damage. So how do I get him to start that circle and and be a good distance away from me? Well, I'm going to need some shoulder control. So if I want him to go to the left, I'm going to be able to direct that shoulder to move to the left to where now he is standing in the position on that circle. His nose is facing left. His tail is facing to the right. I've already had him backed away from me, so he's a good distance away. So you might just start teaching that. I want you to back away while facing me and then turn your shoulder to one direction or the other. And I like to teach these things in, you know, one step at a time because it gets him thinking. If I just crack that whip and say, yeah, and have him run around, we're already off to a bad start. He's just running, his brain's falling out of his head, and, you know, he's not listening. Things are ugly, so. Yeah. 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 So be precise. Back away. Keep, you know, keep your eyes on me. Swing your shoulder to the left or right, depending on which direction I want you to go. So now we can get forward. So at this point, he's, he's backed away from you. He's facing the direction you want him to go on the, on the circle. It would be tempting to now crack your whip and say, yeah, go. Um, but again, I don't want him, I don't want to build that habit early on of just teaching him to run without thinking because that's going to happen under saddle if we have it happening on the ground. So I will teach him to go forward um, a few strides, a few steps. I don't necessarily care what gait he he chooses as long as he, you know, goes forward with some energy off of my cue. Once he moves forward a few steps, then what I'm going to do is put some pressure on his hindquarters and get him to swing his hindquarters away so now he is facing me again. So this does two things. It teaches them just because I've now moved your feet forward, that doesn't mean you turn off your brain and don't listen to me. You need to be ready because I might tell you to do something here. Um, So it it makes them keep their mind on the task at hand without just running around. And I've now put on a button that says that can get my horse to stop 
or change direction. So if he's going to the left and I yield his hindquarters, he swings his hindquarters away and faces me, now we're set up to either stop our lesson, we're done, I've got him to stop lunging, or we can now go the other way and work on the other side. So this is really important because let's say I'm in my 100 by 200 arena and someone else is, is in there riding around and they fall off their horse and their horse starts running around and it's all pandemonium. I have a button that tells my horse, hey, stop for a moment and look at me because something crazy is going on. I don't want you to get all tangled up in this, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so those are the very basic steps to lunging. And, you know, it seems like a lot of steps. And if I wanted to, I could break this down more and more and more until I had millions of micro steps. And if you ever run into confusion with your horse, that's exactly what I recommend you do. Break it down. If it's still not working, break it down more. If it's still not working, break it down even more. And then you'll be surprised at how quickly you can put everything back together again and you have this really nice, flowing, uh, cohesive maneuver that your horse is doing for you. There we go. Cool. So steps one through one of teaching a horse who's never been lunged how to lunge. And it, it's kind of a basic skill. Every horse should have at least a rudimentary understanding of going around in a large circle around a human being in a controlled fashion. Because some people don't use lunging as a training tool. That's fine. But it's a useful skill to have because some of the other things it does for you. Because your horse has to learn to stay out of your space. He learns needs to learn to pay attention to the human he's attached to with a lead rope. And those things apply to other things that don't include lunging. So even if you're someone who's not going to use lunging per se as a training tool, going through that process is a really good life skill for you and the horse. Exactly. And teaching the, the lunging the way I explained for the most part, um, those are the steps that I'm going to want uh, if I'm training an unstarted colt. Uh, that I'm going to want for the first try. Because if you think about it, um, you know, let's look at the part where that horse steps his shoulder out onto that circle. That's my steering that I'm going to use um, under saddle. Because the way that I teach it is I lift my hand in the direction I want my horse to go, and I pick up some pressure on that lead rope so they have to follow that feel on their nose and bring their shoulder through. So when I'm on that colt for the first time, and I say, well, I want you to steer, it's going to feel very similar to what we did on the ground. So that's how I can start introducing steering. And same thing with the stopping. Um, on a baby colt first ride, I'm not going to pull two reins to stop. I will pick up one rein and yield the hindquarters around. So, you know, the steps that I spoke about for changing directions or stopping, that's my one rein stop right there. And the the steps that you use to build a good lunging maneuver, um, I can use those to load my horse on the trailer, to send him into his stall. Um, you'd be really surprised at how kind of universal that exercise can be. There we go. And we're going to take a little break here and hear from Total Saddle Fit, our other sponsor today. I want you to page down a little bit and pick your next question to answer while we do this, Mary. Our other okay. sponsor today, who's been around for ever is Total Saddle Fit. And Total Saddle Fit is known far and wide for their English girth and Western cinches that they make to help your saddle fit better and help your horse be at his athletic best. But you may or may not know that they now make an amazing Western saddle pad. It is called the Perfect Pad, of course. It's a 100% wool felt Western pad, and it has three key features that make it the perfect pad. And one of them is that it is a totally open and free wither, wither f cut back so that you never have the squished withers that get sore. Not going to happen with the perfect pad. It has also had got a vented spine. Again, it's not going to put pressure on their spine. It's also going to help keep their back cool and comfortable. And it is this seamless design and it's got fitting optional fitting shims so that you can get help your less than ideal saddle fit become more ideal. And the folks at Total Saddle Fit have thought of everything. They come in three different sizes. They come in the 28-inch barrel rounded, the 30-inch square, and the 32-inch square for show saddles. 
And as usual, when you order from totalsaddlefit.com, you get free shipping and you have the use it and abuse it guarantee where you can ride in it for 30 days and still refund, re- return it for a full refund, refund if you don't love your perfect saddle pad. And you can find them again at totalsaddlefit.com slash perfect. And if you like to st- shop at your local store establishment, you can find Total Saddle Fit products, all sorts of them, at your local store. All right, Mary, have you picked out your next question? I have. And what um, is it? So this one is from Marie Cornell. She says, my horse stands patiently and quietly while taking off his halter until it's off, and then he wheels and runs, even if there's a feeder there. Um, if I take the halter off, uh, leaving a lead rope around his neck, he does it when I remove the rope. How do I fix this? It could be quite dangerous, which I do agree. Um, The only thing I can think is to give him treats. There's got to be a better way. Yes, he's hard to catch also. (laughs) (laughs) They kind of go together. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, So, yeah, this can be really tricky, especially if they've gotten into a habit of this. Um, So there's a couple of things you can do uh, before taking the halter off your horse that might help get his mind right. Uh, So if I have a horse that's just a little too anxious to get back to the barn or to get into the pasture with his buddies, um, I will start building a habit of teaching him just because I got, you know, we're done with the ride. It does not mean we're done training, and it doesn't mean that you get to now be an idiot. So there's a couple things that you can do. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to have my horses stand tied for a period of time after the ride. So initially this period of time would, will be very short because mentally they just can't handle it. I'm not going to just leave them tied up all day and say, well, good luck, uh, especially if the horse is kind of antsy and nervous and reactive. I, I don't, that's too much to heap onto them to expect them to stand tied for hours and hours. Um, but I, I like to, you know, tie them up maybe five, ten minutes. And now we're, we're done. And even though that doesn't seem related to releasing them into the pasture, it can help just create this mentality of um, just because I'm not riding you or we're not actively doing groundwork, it doesn't mean now you get to be silly and not listen. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing you can start thinking about doing is having your horse stand tied for a, a short period of time. And I will build on that until my horse, if I, um, you know, leave my horse for an hour, two hours, he's okay with that. Uh, because that skill is going to help me in many different areas later on. Uh, the other thing that you might consider doing, and my caveat here is, you know, just be really safe about it and, um, you know, really assess what kind of horse you have and what kind of skill you have with your horse is when you go into your the pasture with your horse, I would do groundwork with him in the pasture. So he oh, thinks, good idea. oh, I'm in the pasture. She's closed the gate. I'm ready to run and be silly and goofy. In fact, I'll do groundwork all the way from the arena to the pasture. So I might send my horse back and forth. Um, so that's kind of like the lunging I was talking about, only I'm going to have him go to the left, yield the hindquarters now to the right, and I'll walk to the pasture as I'm doing that. Um, and then once they once we get to the pasture, maybe I'll work on side passing, maybe I'll work on head down, maybe I'll, I'll lunge them in a few circles, um, and I will wait until they're absolutely listening to me before I take that halter off. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, the first time you ever try this with your horse, especially if he's got a bad habit of not thinking and running off as soon as you turn him loose, this doesn't mean you he's got to stand completely perfect for one hour before you take that halter off. Start with, um, you know, just getting a moment of good behavior, him being calm, and then say, okay, now I will turn you loose. The other thing, and this is a habit that I build with all my horses, whether they have a problem or not, is when we go into the pasture, you are going to turn and face me. And, again, this is that kind of finding your center I know you're thinking of running off with your buddies, but you need to look at me and you need to stand calmly, and now I will take the halter off. Now, as soon as you get the halter off, they might still turn and run and be silly. I can't completely control what happens when the halter is completely loose, 
But if they're facing me, it buys me a little time to get out of Dodge if they decide to turn around and kick up their heels. But I'm hoping that getting your horse thinking and paying attention and being calm uh, by doing the groundwork on the way to the pasture, doing the groundwork in the pasture, waiting till he is calm for at least a moment or two before taking that halter off will help prevent him being silly once he's completely free of that halter. Ooh, all really good stuff. And this is a really common, common problem is not just the whole spin and run off, but that one where you take the halter off and the head flies straight up in the air so you dislocate your shoulder. That's a really common one, too. And uh, yeah. back in the day, one of yeah. the rules I had when I took care of lots of horses and lots of students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is we never used the throat snap on a halter. The halters all had to come on and off using the crown piece because it seemed like there were a lot of horses that when you slid things over their ears, that kind of triggered the behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was one of the things we did. And one of the other things we did is when halters came off, there was always a lead rope around the neck too, so that when you unbuckled it, you could still have a hand on the lead rope at the same time. And the ones that came to me with this habit, um, what we ended up doing is you take the halter off and you relax the pressure on the lead rope around their neck. And if anything besides standing quietly happens, you just don't turn them loose. And you just repeat the process. I'm holding you still with the lead rope around your neck that's up close to your throat latch. And I'm just standing here quietly holding you. There's no punishment involved. There's just, we're just going to stand here for a second. And if I relax it and your facial expression and your body language tell me that you are out of here, Nope, not going to let you loose yet. Let's take a step over here and stand still for a second. Let me rub your face again. And I keep offering that to them. If I'll let the pressure off on your neck, but we're not going anywhere. So we're just going to hang out. And as soon as they go, oh, yeah, we're just hanging out. Then I can take that lead rope off their neck by just letting go of the loose end and letting it slide off and taking a step back because I'm turning my horse loose away from the fence. And that was something that it was kind of a process. This is the this is the best practice at my farm because I had so many different people helping me. And that way it could be consistent for the horses because that one horse might get turned out by half a dozen different people in a given week. And that way it was the same for each person. But that's a great idea to practice it on the way to the field, in the field. And if you have horses, if you have other horses in the field that are, are nosy and pesky, perhaps make sure they have something to distract them, like some piles of hay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You may have to, if you've got an extreme case and you've got an exceptionally nosy herd, uh, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I just inhaled something. <laughs> um, you may have to go out of your way and set it up to where uh, you don't have that herd kind of in your face and everything. And yeah. um, one thing I would add to that is there are rare cases where um Someone has let that horse pull away even with the rope around its neck. And so that horse knows that that rope around my neck, it's kind of a bluff because I can get out of it. Yes, and there are a Um, lot of those out there. (laughs) Yeah. So if you've got one that has already started that habit to where he knows just because you have a rope around my neck, I can can muscle out of that, Um, you can do that same thing that you were just talking about um, but with the halter. So I'll unbuckle the halter and I might tip their nose toward me um, with my hand. So I've got my right hand on the, the tail end of the halter and my left hand on the buckle. So I pretty much have a good hold of that horse's face, but he sees that I've unbuckled the halter. So he might start thinking, oh, I can be silly. Well, I'll just stand there just like you were explaining and say, no, wait, wait, wait. And then when they kind of go, fine, okay, I'm going to stand calmly. Now I will slip that halter off of your face. So so same concept, but that might help if you've got a horse that has figured out, oh, I can just pull pull away yeah, from that rope. Yeah, the horse is really, I'm... really ingrained. Yeah. that I just had a, a kind of a light bulb moment because you talked about practicing these groundwork skills outside of the situation. So we're, we're cutting down on the criteria and we're breaking it down on, into smaller bits. If you have a horse that's, and some horses, that's a trigger. As soon as they feel the neck, the rope go around their neck in anticipation of the halter coming off, that is a trigger for the head to go up and to get ready to bolt. I guess what you could do there is just as part of your regular groundwork training, you're in your round pen, you're in your arena, um, 
put a lead rope around their neck and teach them that a rope around your neck is a training tool. It's just like a halter. It just feels different. And you, and you can give to that pressure and it's a good thing. Find your center. When I feel you feel pressure on that lead rope, find your center by coming towards me and standing still and looking at me and just break that down to help kind of break that, that habitual loop that lead rope around neck means it's time to get turned loose and go yahoo what a great see i didn't expect that question yeah. to fire cool. so many light bulbs how cool yay hey. <laughs> all right so uh, uh, my my brain needs a break it's a little bit tired so we are going to hear from ride my horse more from jared rogerson and when we come back we're going to have another horse radio network auditor question <laughs> City smoke in the air You can see it from anywhere There's a million people driving around Going nowhere Buildings grew up all around me But I still got a painted pony Gonna give her a job Cause she's fat and bored And I'm gonna ride my horse more well, I love to drive my truck The open road feels pretty good But just because you can Doesn't mean that you always should And I can hardly breathe Man, this is killing me I'm gonna ride my horse more Mother Nature, she's been beat up I'd say she's been abused Now even the ocean's black and blue Gasoline just turns to haze And my wallet's on empty anyways Holding the reins is something I can afford So I'm gonna ride my horse more well, I love to drive my truck The open road feels pretty good But just because you can Doesn't mean that you always should And I can hardly breathe Man, this is killing me I'm gonna ride my horse more Got an answer for the problems of today Well, you can find your own solution As for me, I found my way Cause I can hardly breathe Man, this is killing me I'm gonna ride my horse more Let's ride Jared Rogerson, Ride My Horse More. Who doesn't want to do that? You can find his music by going to jaredrogerson.com or your favorite music player. All right. 
What's our next question? We have one more question to squeeze in before we talk donkeys. Who's it going to be? Okay, and I will try and be brief. This comes from Jessica Troop, and she says she's got a horse that is too excited and wants to spill into the canner any chance that he gets. Um, he's become really forward when he used to never be this way. I can tell he's bored and needs to do more, but he wants to go straight to the fun stuff of cantering and jumping, um, w- uh, like jumping over ground poles when he should be trotting calmly over them. So for any horse that you're doing kind of a performance um, event with, like working on jumping, uh, this is very common um, you know, breeding plays a big aspect into it. These horses are meant to have energy and be sensitive, and they're meant to love their job. So they get really excited, and they want to go too fast and not think about it. And uh, this problem can really get away with us and be very hard to break. Um, so I'm actually going to give you something to try that I use for reining horses. Um, so similar to horses that, that do, you know, jumps for a living, uh, with a reining horse, they tend to start anticipating some of the maneuvers we want to do with them, like a sliding stop. So if you watch a sliding stop, the horse uh, comes down the center of the arena and they build speed until they're galloping and then they bury their butt in the ground and have this big, explosive, cool stop. And when you train them to do that and you show in that event a couple of times, that horse starts to know, oh, when I turn the corner at this end of the arena, I'm going to be running. And what happens is they start to take off before we, you know, we want them to. They build way too much speed, so now the stop is not going to work. And we can get in this argument with them, which makes them even more nervous about running down that center line. Um, so we want to prevent that, if at all possible, or help fix it if it starts getting a little too out of control. So one of the things that we teach our rainers is how to fence, which essentially means I want my horse to canter from one end of the arena to the other. And um, the uh, the things that I'm going to accomplish with this is getting my horse to go in a straight line without me having to hold him on that straight line. But it's also an exercise I use to teach the horse to wait, to wait for me before he builds speed. And you don't have to do this just across the long end of the arena. I do this all over the arena. And you can start off at a trot. Um, and what I would do is find find a point on the fence um, in your arena and just ride right to it. You don't have to be super fancy. They don't have to be all collected and everything. I just point the nose to that spot. I'd like to do this on a loose rein if possible. Your reins do not have to be flapping in the breeze, but I'm, I'm really giving my horse some free rein to go. Um, so if your horse is particularly speedy, you'll want to do this across several lines across the, um, short lines across the short end of your arena instead of going down the center line, if that makes sense. So I'm going to ride my horse directly to that point, and I'm going to let the fence stop him, meaning I'm not going to pull him up to stop. I'm just going to keep his nose right on that point. A lot of horses, when you first start this, they'll break down and maybe go from a canter to a trot or even a walk. That's totally fine. I let them do that. I let them slow themselves down, and I let them get as close to the fence as they're willing to do. And once they find that point, we're going to sit here, and we're just going to go, ah, rest for a few moments. And then I'm going to turn around and find a new point on the fence on the opposite side of the arena, and I'm going to ride toward that. So if you've got a really peppy horse, he might want to canter the whole time and even build a little bit of speed. As long as he's not out of control, I'm just going to ride him straight and true to that point I'm looking at toward the arena. I'm just going to use my hands to keep his nose on that dot I've imagined on that, uh, that point on the fence that I'm riding toward. And once we get there, I'm going to let him rest. So this might feel a little zippy and kooky at first, um, but I do this. I'm very calm when I do this. I just do this over and over and over again and until it's like the most boring thing in the world to that horse. Um, and what I think this does, I think it helps straighten your horse out. And so if you you know, need to work on straight lines for taking your jumps and ground poles, it's very helpful for that. But I think... What it does is it it gives your horse a chance to move forward if he wants to move forward, but I do this kind of in a monotonous, like, okay, now let's go to this side. Okay, let's go to this side. And I'm not really trying to pull him back and hold, or hold him back if I can help it. 
And it just becomes like a job for that horse. He's like, it, it doesn't, it, the cantering and trying to build speed starts to lose allure for him. And by letting him go a little bit, you know, he's, he gets a chance to build speed in between those points you're riding uh, towards. So he, he doesn't feel like you're really holding him back. Uh, so you're giving him a little bit of freedom in that sense, but he's going to have to stop because here comes the fence again. And so you just kind of go, stop, go, stop, go, stop. And so pretty soon he realizes, well, yes, I'm going to get to go, but that fence is coming. I'm going to have to slow down anyway. And they start to kind of regulate their speed a little bit on their own. And this might, I don't ever really fix this in one session. Um, I might just work on this after my horse is nice and warmed up. Um, I might just work on this post-to-post exercise, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over again. And every day I'm looking where I'm looking for a stopping point when my horse has kind of gone, eh, I'm a little tired. This wasn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. And they start to slow down. Better still, if my horse had been cantering the whole time and he wants to drop to trot, I'm going to say, yeah, drop to trot. I'm going to totally let you do that. I want to make him feel good for making that decision. And it starts, the the idea of them getting really excited and running really fast, it just start, stops feeling like such a novelty to them. You've given them a chance to go, but it's pretty controlled because we're not letting them go very far before they have to stop again. And you can do this to the point where that horse will just, what I call pony lope, they, you know, they'll just lope really slow and easy from one point to the other. And I think that in turn will help when you're uh, working on taking straight lines over jumps and other obstacles. A good idea. And that is, that is a, it is a challenge to overcome with a lot of thoroughbreds and other blood breeds, like you said. That's a great idea to just use that fence and, Again, I'm going to ask the question if I'm doing this wrong. So if you're going through this process and your horse canters down to the fence and wants to get kind of close to the fence and then duck left or right quickly and leave you behind or some other really undesirable or perhaps dangerous behavior, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing that is allowing that to happen or causing that to happen versus the horse going straight toward the fence and going, gosh, there's a fence in my way. I should stop. Well, that kind of back and forth behavior going to the fence is not uncommon. In fact, it probably will happen the first few times. So especially if you're in an English saddle, when you're coming to that point on the fence, the thing to focus on, just keep their nose right on that point. And when you start closing the gap uh, toward that fence, sit down and deep in the saddle and just kind of be ready to ride left or right. Um, but after the first few times, I've really only had it when, when I've done taught the horses for the first time. It's usually only that first point that they'll do that because – I'll just gently, you know, block them if they want to go right. I'll put their nose to the left and vice versa. And when we get to that point, um, I'll bring them to a stop and just let them rest. And pretty soon, within a couple of repetitions of doing this, that horse will actually go nice and true to that point because as soon as he gets there, he gets relief. He's like, oh, we get to stand here for a moment. My person's not bothering me. And um, that is how we get those reining horses to run um, with such confidence towards the other end of that arena because they've practiced it a lot and they know that when they get to that other side, they get relief. Um, so, yeah, I would say just be mindful the first couple of times you do this. That's why if you can, it's probably better to start it at a trot so it's a little bit easier to ride if they get a little dodgy toward that fence. The other thing I would say is some horses are a little scared running straight to the fence because they've never done that before, and this is weird, and why are we doing this? So some horses I will let stop, um, you know, 10 or 20 feet shy of the fence. If they're, if they're spooky and they're saying, I don't want to go to the fence, I'll say just get as close as you can, and then the next time maybe we'll get a few strides closer. So I'd say the biggest um, success tip for get, doing this right is, again, don't be in this punishing mind frame. Don't demand perfection and just treat it like we're just going to do the most boring thing today. We have to get through this. If you get really amped up and too much, you're being too much of a perfectionist, then they'll just find anxiety in this exercise the way they have been in other areas of riding. How true. Again, another great question that just brings to mind all sorts of different ways I can apply this 
to Zippy Horses. So I'm going to wrap up the show today with the conversation that we've all been anticipating, donkeys. Yes. And first, you're, you're going to answer a question for me. Is there a difference between a donkey and a burro? Or is it just a generic term that is interchangeable? They're pretty much interchangeable. Some people will say, well, a burro is a wild donkey that's smaller and furrier. But officially, donkey, burro, same thing. Okay. So, you got some more burros. Tell us all the burro details. Okay, so I've actually got my hands. I've got two little burros. Um, I believe they're both under a year old. They're oh, so they're little cute. babies. Oh, they're so cute. And um, one is a little chocolate. They're both girls. One's a little chocolate burro, and the other is uh, she's gray underneath six inches of blonde, shaggy fluff. She looks like a sheepdog. I thought she looked a little um, bit like a long-eared alpaca. Yeah, yeah. she's got like four inches of hair coming out of her ears and she's got this really adorable like kind of blunt forelock fluff on her head um of the two she is the one who's most willing to let me touch her and handle her and uh, the other one is still just a little bit wary but i'll get to her and i haven't named them yet so if anyone has good ideas for names i am all ears Literally <laughs> and figuratively, <laughs> so to speak. Look out for the donkey puns. Here they come. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> and uh, actually, someone had asked, well, what's the difference in training uh, donkeys and horses? And That's a whole episode um, by itself. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite analogies, and it, uh, it's usually, it pertains to training mules, is um, the way that you should train a horse is the way you must train a mule. Um, and so pretty much it means that mules don't, and donkeys, in, uh, in turn, they don't really suffer foals. And if you are not effective and fair, you're not going to get anywhere with them. And this is where the idea of them being stubborn comes from. Um, it's usually that they're so smart, they know that this person doesn't know what the heck they're doing, and I'm going to make you look foolish now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The other, I think the major difference between your long ears and your horses is while both are prey, they're all prey animals, and they do have a flight instinct, a donkey especially cannot, they don't have the stamina to be able to just run a million miles away at the side of a plastic bag. You know, a horse has that luxury. He could just run and run and run, and then later on he can think, well, was that a mountain lion or a plastic bag? Who cares? I'm out of danger. Um, the donkey, they just, they don't, they can't run that fast and that far. They have to conserve energy. That energy is very precious to them. So they think a lot more and they're like, eh, it's a plastic bag. I'll probably be fine. I'm going to stay here. And they can also have a little bit more of a fight response, uh, especially your jack donkeys. Um, and, They, uh, you know, because, again, because the prey instinct is not quite as strong, they've got other tools at their disposal to keep them safe. So when you're training them, you have to realize that, well, I can take most any horse and slap a bag in the round pen and get them to gallop around 400 times. That donkey, um, you know, you slap that bag a couple of times, he may move a little bit and then he'll go, eh. That, that doesn't bother me. I'm going to stand still. So you have to be very compelling um, in how you convince them to do things for you, which can be frustrating if you've never trained a long year before. There we go. Maybe uh, so when, when when you get your trainer's license, you have to train a donkey. Is that it? <laughs> That's I your final exam. Training, yeah. <laughs> I consider training donkeys and mules like graduate work for horse trainers. Interesting. So you're too little burrows that you just got uh, about what size do you think they will be when they're adults and what size are they now um so i i'm not very good with hands if it's anything under 13 hands but they are um definitely shorter than hip uh heights on me well, they're, you know, they're, like, they're so tiny i have to crouch down to touch them um they'll probably be a good standard size donkey which i don't know 36 inches. I'm so bad with numbers when it when it's 
like pony size or smaller. <laughs> They'll be like super large dog size. They'll be about the size of my Irish wolfhound when they're done growing, I oh, think. So they, they're definitely little itty bitty size that are going to be used for driving or pack work and things like that. They're not going to be riding animals. No, not unless it's a tiny child. Yeah, interesting. So you got, why did you get two? You want to do a tip challenge. Why did you get two instead of one? Well, one, my mom came with me, oh, and well. I Thanks, had mom. to convince her not to get four. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really glad we got two because, um, you know, they're really young. They they only just got hauled to Oklahoma last week, and then I took them on a long drive home in the heat, and they're settling in. They're, on, they're in their own separate pen, and so I think it's good for, you know, them to have a buddy to kind of help them get you know, uh, get through. So they've got each other, which uh, I think is going to be really good for them mentally. Yeah. I always, I, I've never worked personally with donkeys or burros are really, you know, kind of clueless. They seem a very, very social animal, even more so than horses. They really want to be yeah. with donkeys. That's what they want to do. Yes. In my pasture i have donkeys mules and horses and the mules are sort of interchangeable but the donkeys hang with the donkeys and the horses hang with the horses they get along just fine they their herds will intermingle but um they like they really like their own kind it's it's a sad thing if you only just have one donkey i feel very sad when i see one donkey alone in the pasture even if he's like with a herd of cattle you know, that's that's not bad, but it's not a donkey. They, so if you ever think about getting a donkey, adopting a donkey, a donkey I do recommend getting two. Uh, preferably not an uh, unaltered Jack and a Jenny, because then you'll have several donkeys in very short order. Yeah, um, yeah and, and ja- then- Jack donkeys, um, yeah, they they defend their space. It's not. It's really not any smarter than having a stallion standing around as a pet. It's... It's not ideal. Yeah. If you've never had a donkey before, do not get a jack. They're a huge pain in the butt. Um, and and a donkey, even some as tiny as these, when they bray, um, they sound like a foghorn. You can hear it for miles. And so that's something else to think of is there are some people live within ordinances where you cannot have a donkey. And it's specifically because of how loud they get. The sound, and yeah. if you feed them any kind of breakfast... Be prepared to hear that at five in the morning for the rest of your life. Oh, so it's smart if you're if your donkeys, because donkeys, I I'm guessing, are reasonably easy keepers that could live oh, well yeah. on a, a forage only diet and very limited grain, if any. Um, feed it at lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they can live, you know. And you, you think if you think about where where these guys came from originally, these burrows are, you know, the uh, the ones that I have. They came from Arizona, but they are descended from um, donkeys that miners brought over, I believe, in like the 1860s. But even before that, they were like a North African um, uh, descent. So these guys are used to arid, high desert, eating nothing, you know, hardly anything and being still being quite hardy. So... Um, you don't want to get your donkey too fat and feed them too rich a diet because they can get quite fat very easily, and it's just not needed. They, they usually pr- do pretty well with very little. Yeah, that's so cool. Congratulations on the new donkeys, and we are looking forward to the many, 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 many suggested names from the Horse Radio Network auditors on the Horse Radio Network auditors Facebook page. And I think for today, that's about a wrap-up. And we're going to have regular updates about the two new girls, I'm sure, as the months go by. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, remind everybody where they can find Mary Kitzmiller and your amazing artwork. Uh, You can find me on Facebook under Mary Kitzmiller Horsemanship. You can find uh, me with that same handle on Instagram. Um, If you are interested in seeing some of the jewelry we're creating, that is Troublemaker Trading Company. Uh, Again, both on Facebook and Instagram. There we go. And for clinics, demonstrations, etc., that's also going to be Mary Kitzmiller Horsemanship? Yep. All righty. Check it out, everybody. We'll be back again tomorrow. Really bad ad day. 